Okay, welcome everybody who has joined in for this Haridox uh, webinar on the events method for documentation of human rights violations. Uh, my name is Bert. I'm senior documentalist with Haridox. I'll basically give the presentation today and um, it will last for a good half an hour and afterwards there will be um, enough time left for uh, questions and answers, discussions on any issues related to uh, methods for documenting human rights violations. Um, besides me, there's also my colleagues, Kristen Anton, based in New York State, and Indira Cornelio, uh, based in Mexico City, um, who take part in this uh, call and are glad to, to also respond to, to questions that you may have. Um, this presentation is about the events method for documentation of human rights violations. Um, human rights monitoring work is about information. Getting the facts straight is the basic requirement for many organizations work. Thus, information management is at the very heart of what we do. And the event-based method is one a single case of a killing or any other type of violation is one too many. Because as human rights defenders, uh, we would love to live in a world where there's no violations at all. And the events method has been used by human rights uh, organizations for decades to document visible types of violations in particular. Uh, violations of civil and political rights, killings, abductions, torture and detention. Though one can also uh, document more um, abstract and, and, and long-term types of violations. Um, the method involves investigating events and determining which acts within the event may be or could lead up to uh, violations of human rights. Just a little bit of uh, a background about how we as Haridox worked on this events uh, method in 1988. We, uh, Harry Dux set up a task force for, with representatives of human rights groups, which had a broad experience in documenting human rights violations in their own countries. Um, at that time, uh, there were large scale violations, as you, you may recall, in countries like Argentina, Chile, Peru, Central American countries, Philippines, Zimbabwe. And we also involved organizations that receive a lot of information on cases of violations, which Amnesty International, the World Organization Against Torture, and the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions. And um, so basically the group collected and, and, and shared uh, formats and experiences of human rights groups which had been doing this documentation work brought them together, compared them, analyzed them. And in 1993, um, the task force produced the first edition of the event's standard formats. Uh, after that, the formats were improved on basis of inputs that we received from users and through consultations, in particular with the Science and Human Rights Program of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And at that time in 1998, we also started launching the first software called FSIS, uh, which was around, um, which was then followed by Win FSIS and Open FSIS. And the second uh, edition of the paper formats was produced in 2001. Just um, a quote to illustrate why we focus on the method for doc human rights documentation. Uh, a quote from Patrick Ball from the AAAS Science Human Rights Program at the time, uh, now working with the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Of course, human rights work is about much more than methodology. It's about right and wrong framed in the legal and moral dimensions of international human rights instruments. But by doing the technical work right, we can greatly strengthen our ability to make claims about human rights. 
and ultimately to advocate for a more respectful work. Why do we need a method for documenting human rights violations? Um, let's have a look at like a typical information flow within a, a, a group document the cases of violations. Initially, you receive like lead information, which can be a phone call or an article in, in a newspaper, um, which relates to human rights issue in your country. Um, you consider if this falls within the mandate of your group, and then if you decide to actually work further on this, you uh, usually start doing so by collecting testimonies and similar information. Sometimes you may also go to the location where the violation took place to collect physical and documentary evidence. That together allows you basically to establish the, the facts with regard to the case. What happened, where did it happen, when did it happen, who was involved. You would then record that data in a systematic way um, using standard formats. We'll talk about that later on. And you'll also basically store that information either manually and more and more often these days in, into a computerized uh, system, which could be a, a spreadsheet or a database. Storing information, of course, would allow you also to retrieve that information to uh, be able to compile narrative and similar reports and also to produce information which you use initially for your internal analysis with regard to particular cases or also on the longer term with regard to like a number of related cases to see for trends and tendencies over time. And also um, using a database in particular would allow you then to extract materials for dissemination like press releases or annual reports, thematic reports, etc. When documenting human rights violations, um, we find ourselves filling out forms, gathering information from different sources. Um, we record examples and characteristics of victims. One victim, as you can see, can have more than one violation. It allows to document multiple violations or one violation uh, committed against a number of persons. For this presentation, We'll be using a, a sample case of how the method, uh, events method for documenting human rights violations is applied in, in an event that, that is called the Silva and others arrest at the 25 November protest. And basically the scenario is that on 25th November 2008, four members of a women collective were detained at Syracuse during the International Day for Emanation of Violence. They were presented 10 hours later to the municipality. One suffered a sexual assault and the other suffered torture while in detention. How do we present that information in um, a logical way? Um, we can basically um, make like a, like a linear presentation where we write out the different cases, each one in a line. And when human rights organizations begin to represent information about violations, very often people begin to focus, on, begin with focusing on the victim. What was he or he a victim of? Just the first step can often be to think of each victim having suffered one particular kind of violation. Just the organization can create a database that looks like a table. The bigger problem with this kind of rather simple presentation is that it does not allow to analyze trends. If you are only capturing one violation, even if several have happened, you cannot claim any increase or decrease in the violation for one period of time to another, for example. And another problem is that it's not limited to computer databases or questionnaires or statistics as such, but to the analytical framework an organization uses to remember events in a systematic way. Um, well, the next uh, 
slide here we show how you can add multiple violations. You see that under the arrest, you can put a cross under the sexual account, a sexual assault, uh, you can mark it as well. And so it, it shows that Patricia Silva has been both arrested and assaulted. But while we can now record uh, more violations, we still have an issue. We can only add one perpetrator for each violation. Like in the in the first case, Sylvia uh, Patricia Silva was arrested and assaulted by the man in police uniform, the man numbered one. Of course, you can also then find a creative way to overcome this by just adding a second column for um, the for a second perpetrator in, in case so uh, Patricia was uh, her rights were violated by two different persons but that again it, it still causes a problem um, because as you can see uh, we cannot identify which violation was committed by which perpetrator so wh whatever we try to do in this kind of linear presentation um, we, we face uh, certain uh, limits. And this solution addressed the connection between the violation and the perpetrator. But it is sloppy to repeat the names of victims who suffered abuses by more than one perpetrator. You see, you've got like a line for Sylvia Patricia um, who was arrested by, by and then this, this, she was also assaulted by somebody else. But then we have got two Sil Patricia Silvas in the database. Uh, which is already a problem if you only have her name, but if you also start adding other characteristics of that person, um, like her occupation, uh, then if, if you then start doing counts, you know, it, it would not get the, the correct information. So overall, the, the problem with uh, the events um, documentation is what, what, what you're trying to do is to capture a reality. And the reality is dynamic, it changes over time. And it is hard. what you want to do is actually to capture more complex scenarios. And um, so that the events method approach uh, enables com th those more complex scenarios to be documented in a straightforward manner by representing the relationships between the cases of individual victims involved in each event. Okay, now we basically try to illustrate how that looks like getting away a little bit from this more linear ap approach to uh, a relational approach. We can start from the acts uh, which were committed in this case. There was arrest, there was sexual assault, and there was torture. For human rights documentation, usually the most important link structure is an act of human rights violations. An act is the smallest, smallest unit of history represented in the human rights database. An act represents the most basic who did what to whom information in the system. And it is defined as a single piece of movement or action, usually involving force. And most often an act is committed by a person, an individual or a group against another, in which case it is an act of commission. An act can also mean the non-performance of an expected or required movement or action, in which, it ca in which case it is referred to as an act of omission. An actual violent act is a combination of two people, a perpetrator and the victim, who are related by a particular uh, type of violence. Various individuals or groups can be involved in an event or a relation to an event. In the typical instance of a human rights violation, there is a perpetrator, a victim, and an act. The most significant roles are those of the victim and perpetrator. The victim is the person, individual, or group who is the object of the act. And the perpetrator is the person, individual, or group who commits an act that constitutes or can constitute a violation. Perpetrators can be state or non state entities. The means used could be concrete arms such as guns or more abstract processes such as lawmaking. Here you see um, an example of a presentation of a relational 
uh, character. Where you at the left, you have the victims, Patricia, Roma, Geraldine, and Carla. And you can then just follow the lines to see what happened to each person. You can see Patricia was arrested, Roma was arrested, Geraldine and Carla, they were all arrested. Then later on, Carla was also to tortured, Patricia was assaulted. And then you can also identify the perpetrators related to the arrest, to the sexual assault and, and to the torture. And it's also possible that one person can have multiple role in, in different events or even in the same event. Roma Rodriguez has more than one role. In, she was a victim, but she also was the witness to the, in, in the sexual assault against Patricia Silva. As, as mentioned, you know, victims and also perpetrators can be individuals, but it can also be groups or institutions. Just to give some examples, an act of beating victimizes an individual. An act of surveillance gets to get the whole organization to uh, victimization. An act that reduces the budget for education victimizes the youth in the country. And the act of imposing a curfew victimizes the whole population of a town or of a country. So then we try to put it all in, in, in the context and the context of a uh, human rights violation is the event. And the event is something that happens. It's got the beginning and an end and it progresses until it's logical in conclusion. It can, and then an act can contain a, a single act. It can be a series of related acts or a combination of related acts happening together. The chain of events can record the relationships between two and more events. An event can cause another event, etc. The victim and the violation he or she suffered must not be separated from the information about who committed the violation, where and when it happened, and in what context the violation happened. The connection must be made at the level of the violation, the act, because any other level leaves open the possibility of confusing who did what to whom. And then, you know, on basis of this more open uh, model, uh, what, uh, so we have like the different, what we call entities, we have the events, we have the persons, um, and, and then they are linked through the acts, the involvement, information, and intervention, according to their uh, roles. Um, and, and that basically means that for the acts, um, it, when you record an act, you basically link a, a, per, a person to a human rights violation uh, it, it, by filling out the, the involvement format, you make the person a perpetrator, the information format is for sources and the intervention format for intervening parties, those who basically try to assist the victim or prosecute the perpetrator. You can then link events together through a chain of events. You can bring persons together by the biographic details format, and you can also, if required, record additional uh, information about specific violations through the additional details format. So basically for each of those formats, Heridox uh, drafted uh, a number of like default uh, formats with, with a very uh, generic uh, structure, which basically are presented uh, here. Uh, this is an example of an event format with information. And first of all, about the format itself, you see that there is different uh, types of uh, fields. The, the first fields are like to identify uh, the record, event record number and title. Then there are fields for information about the facts, where it took place, the, the geographical term and local area, when it took place, the date, the beginning and the end, what happened in the event description, the consequences and remarks 
for additional information. This is followed then by information which provides like an analysis, uh, who committed, uh, what, what violations were committed, um, what rights were affected. And finally, there are some administrative fields like the data information was received or also when it was recorded into the database. Um, as you will notice in this form that you know some fields have text written uh, by the, 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 the organization recording uh, the information. Other fields have like the code or a term, a geographical term, or the terms used for the violation index, rights affected, etc. Um, this is basically done to allow a retrieval of information in a systematic way. And it also helps uh, in recording information by using a terminology list. Um, we basically can avoid spelling mistakes, uh, indiscriminate use of synonyms, like using death penalty or capital punishment. And it, it, it certainly also leads to an easier and, and better retrieval of information if you have recorded a larger number of cases. We've been also doing quite some work on this and we actually produced a total of 48 different microtosori, all relevant for work in, in the field of documenting human rights violations. Just to give you one example of how such a list looked like, um, uh, like a type of acts uh, list, as you see that there's like different codes um, which they indicate the level of, of the term. Zero one then is like the highest level, the violation of the right to life, which then there's like sub levels, deliberate killing of specific individuals, and then they get more and more specific as the list goes on. So just to get back what I just mentioned, about um, structured versus uh, free text. Structured information is easier to search, compare counts, identify, uh, for identifying patterns and trends over time, which allows you then to make statistics. You can also import the information into a database and you can, it's, it makes it easier to input data. Free text is good for when you cannot translate everything into fields and labels. And it also makes the case more real and lively as people relate better to narrative accounts and structural data or only cold figures. So with free text, you can convey the cumulative effects of several violations on the person. And as you will understand what you would do when setting up your database, it would be a combination of structured text and free text. You have to consider every time what is most important and which information you can best represent in structured text and which best in free text. Then of course, the reason why you make all those efforts to record the information in particular in the database is because you want to have information out of the system. And actually in developing um, an information system, what you will have to look at from the very beginning is what you what information you would like to get out of it. And there's also different ways then of how you can present information. You can create lists, case summaries, ad hoc queries and counts. Here's an example of a list, list of detained uh, persons in Mexico, where you have information about their, their names, their ages, um, their status, the procedure, and whether they were punished. So that information would be able to extract from a database. Um, you can also then present it in, in a more attractive way if you have like a picture for each uh, victim, um, people, these are like journalists, human rights advocates who are on trial for doing their job, so you extract that from a database and then you just uh, also have on, on, on file the picture. And so you can actually, every time you can select which information from your database you would like to extract 
either to your published report, printed report, or to a public website, which uh, presents um, your data in, in an attractive way towards the general public. Um, on basis of the data which you have collected and in particular when using um, structured information by using lists, you'll be able to do counts. Um, like in this uh, database from a group working on transgender issues in Europe, you can see that the total number of cases is this, and then you, it has been basically been divided by uh, types of violations, uh, starting from the most frequent one. And then you can also present uh, the same information through a, a map illustrating uh, where in which different countries, in this case, violations took place. A more um, attractive uh, way of presenting information about uh, particular individual cases is by making case summaries as illustrated here. And so um, basically when I showed these uh, formats and this the sample of the Zaris a moment ago, it's, it's basically extracted from like the general framework which uh, our redux developed for documenting human rights violations. The idea was that, you know, there's no point in each organization reinventing the wheel, as we know that have happened uh, a lot. We just wanted to help organizations on the way by coming up with a rather generic system. At the same time, you know, we realized also from, from the beginning and probably even more uh, nowadays that each organization is uh, different and unique and wants to do things in its own way, the way it suits it best it, it, its own aims and work. And so um, basically each organization could and should adapt um, a system and develop a system uh, for documentation of violations based upon a number of uh, factors such as the objectives of the monitoring and documentation work. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to support victims, bring perpetrators to justice, get a better understanding of the characteristics of victims and perpetrators and trends over time? Then also it depends upon the types of violations that you will be monitoring. When you develop your own system, you also have to look from the beginning at the outputs that you would like to produce, which can be collaboration on individual cases, inputs for reports, trends, graphs, and statistics. And then, of course, it also depends upon this human, financial, and other resources that you have available, and who is responsible for and participating in the different stages of monitoring and documentation. So the events model and the formats which Haridox developed, they give like a general framework for documenting human rights violations. And it is really important that, you know, you can take it as a starting point, but you, the main thing is indeed that you sit together with your colleagues and come up with a system which best matches your needs and requirements, taking into account what, what, what I just mentioned. And for your documentation project, to work out the most important recommendation that we can give is that you really take the time to develop the data model, the formats, the fear and the sorry that are most useful to you on the long term. And it helps to draft an initial system, try it out for a couple of weeks or maybe a few months at most with a limited number of difficult cases that you receive. You then review um, what information you collected and uh, how you put it into the information system based on those experiences. And then you can basically adapt your system to uh, what, what you learned in, in that way. And the main challenge is to have a system that delivers all the outputs that you require in a smooth way and that at the same time can be easily maintained by those collecting, recording, and analyzing information. Monitoring and documentation of violations should serve your organization and not become an administrative or bureaucratic burden.
So this is basically the introduction which I would like to give and now I would like to open the floor for, for questions. Thank you, Bert. Uh, this is Kristen from here at Ox, everybody. And I can see that we have nine people watching the YouTube presentation. And for those of you watching, if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and share those now in the chat so that Bert and the rest of us can address any questions that you have. There aren't any questions so far, Bert. Um, any general comments on, on, on this presentation and any, any feedback which you have? Anybody who would like basically to share also their, their own experiences and if you, what you just heard now somehow relates to what, what you've been doing yourself? I was thinking that uh, people might be interested to see how this methodology or how data organization is applied uh, through these online database systems. And I thought maybe if it would be helpful for people, we could show them a couple examples like Transgender Europe and the Tibetan Political Prisoners Database. And I also put together a quick example of how to organize the example that we shared in this presentation in Uwazi. I could I could also share my screen too if that's helpful. I think that would be quite a helpful question just to okay. to continue. So I'll stop sharing and I'll, I'll let you share your screen. Okay, sounds good. All right, everybody. Please go ahead and keep um, typing in any questions that you have in the chat. And Indira is there monitoring. But in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and share a couple examples with everybody. So one quick thing, oh, maybe I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, Heridox has, as Bert mentioned in the very beginning of the presentation, Heridox has developed a number of different information systems to, um, in order for groups to actually implement this methodology. And we started with EVSYS, and then we moved to Win EVSYS, and then we moved to Open EVSYS, and now we are in the process of migrating Open EVSYS to Uwazi Reveal, which is our latest tool, our information system. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add something, Bert? That's okay. Uh, that, that this is actually like you know, a, a logical development. If if we look back at our history, it basically means that our software lasts for about ten years, eight to ten years, and then you know the time is right because technology um, it improves, things become uh, easier, more user friendly. So at a certain moment, you say, "Hey, let that's um, make an effort to develop a new kind of database." Um, like the differences between. If you look at the very first database and and and, and what we now have, have, have as far as see the differences are really quite big, not only in how it looks like, but also the flexibility you, uh, users have in terms of how they can organize and retrieve information. It has become more and more dynamic as as as, as time goes by. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, for Awazi. Uh, this is basically a, an online information system that allows you to create a data model as a starting point to organize your information, but it's also flexible enough that you can change your data model as you learn more about the information that you're collecting or about the events that are happening or about new trends that you want to be able to track. So it's very powerful in that way. Um, and right now I'm showing you an example of um, a system that we're putting together. It's actually not completely finished, but um, it's helpful to see where 
where we're at right now. This is the Transgender Europe platform. Um, and you can see that from the information that they've entered into the system, uh, you can see counts of different types of violations. The screenshot was actually included in the presentation. And you can also see a geographic representation of the cases that they've documented. And this is dynamic, so you can go ahead and click on any of the bubbles and you can see um, these are just codes for names of people in the system. And then if you go to the main library of this database, this is where all the information is stored. You can see it in either a list or as a map. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to list view and you can open up any of these people. And these are all the properties that this organization has organized this information by. Mm -hmm. But it's a pretty simple and straightforward mm -hmm. data model. There's not, this isn't really a very good representation of the events methodology because it's, it's really just talking about each person individually at this point. A similar um, system is this Tibetan Center for Human Rights and Democracy. This is their political prisoners database that we've built. So they have a lot of information in this database and here are some basic counts. Uh, and then we have the map of the different cases that is again, dynamic. Um, and there's some other different ways to visualize the information that's in here. So we have length of sentence, um, male versus female. And if we go to the library, we can see all the different ways that we can filter this information. And this is completely configurable based on your own data model. But um, this collection is, again, completely based on people. So each, each entity here is a, a person, it's a prisoner in this case, and you can see all these different ways of filtering down. So if you wanted to just see the female prisoners, you could narrow it down by filtering on that, and then you could continue to filter down more to narrow down your list. So let's see, I wanted to see the female prisoners, uh, their length of sentence is three to five years. I can see that there's 111 people that are in both of those filters together. And I can see that, what else do I wanna filter on? There's 100 people that have been released. Those people that are responsible for the arrest and detention. Location of the prison. It's interesting to see that 102 are in the Tibet Autonomous Region. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing that I'll show you is um, a quick representation of the example that we presented, that Bert presented mm -hmm. earlier. So this is the event that was presented, the Silva et al. arrest in a short description and a country and a date of this event. Um, but it could also be like a duration of dates. So this is all customizable. Um, now, if I go over to the what's called connections, this is where you start to see the relationships between different entities in this system. So we can see that this event has three acts. This is how we've organized the data model in this case. And if we open up any one of these acts, we can see what relationships that act has. So we can see that this act is related to this event and through that event, it's related to these other acts. But if we move down, we see another relationship hub where we can see the perpetrator involved in this act and we can see the victim involved in this act. And then we can continue to explore other relationships. So let's say we want to see the any other acts that this particular perpetrator has been involved in. We can look at it from that angle and we can see that um, this is Carla Perez, that this perpetrator was involved in this act of torture. 
And we can also see that there's another relationship hub that's related to the act called sexual assault of Patricia Silva. And you can see that the victim is here as well. And then you can also see that this perpetrator was involved in a, a third act, which was the arrest of Silva, Rodriguez, Ali, and Perez. So this is pretty, this is the same for each, each act in this case. So if I look at the arrest of Silva, Rodriguez, Ali, and Perez, I see that it's related to the event. This is one type of relationship hub up here is the other acts that it's related to in relation to the event. But then if I scroll down, I can see that uh, there's a few other relationship hubs here where one is um, explaining that the, this perpetrator, the man in police uniform three, is involved in this act as well as this victim. And in this case, it's interesting because you can actually separate, um, this might be a little too complicated, but you can see that um, in this act, there are three different perpetrators and they're connected to four different victims. Uh, and it, it can be helpful in a information system to be able to separate that out. So this, this relationship hub approach makes it clear that this perpetrator is connected to this victim as opposed to this perpetrator being connected to the other people that were arrested at the same time. So if you know that detail, you want to be able to capture it. That's very important. Yeah. And, and then indeed, if you want to find information, for example, about an, an individual perpetrator, you just go to the right side, you go down to the person, and you'll be able to actually get a list of... of yeah, you can go to each one. Yeah. I think it's, and I could also go back here and look at the persons involved. So I can see man in uniform three. And yeah, you can have any kind of, there's no information here, but you can have any kind of properties that you want for this person, like their rank or their location or their badge number. But here you can see at the right again, you know, from from the perpetrator, which uh, which acts and which victims mm -hmm. they're related to. So uh, if if you remember, like what we showed in the beginning, you know, the the the, the table with with with, with the lines, and, and and you see that this is like a completely different way of uh, representing information, which really gives you much more flexibility, and which also comes. Closer to actually showing what what 